In this video, we'll explore the E1 mechanism, one of the basic mechanisms in organic chemistry, usually taught in the context of E2, SN1, and SN2 mechanisms. The E in E1 stands for elimination, which refers to the loss of a leaving group, here the green ball representing chlorine. The 1 in E1 refers to the kinetics of the mechanism, and means that the slowest step, the loss of the leaving group, is dependent on the chlorine carbon chain alone. No other molecules are required. In other words, one molecule starts the reaction, and usually heat is enough to cause the detachment to occur. Once the leaving group departs, a positive charge is left on the carbon chain. This can lead to carbocation rearrangement, although this particular example doesn't show it. Finally, in the absence of other negative charges, and typically in the presence of a weak base, also not shown, the carbon chain defaults to deprotonation, and a double bond forms as a scar. That's E1 in a nutshell, but let's break this down and start with a simpler example, such as this unrealistic cartoonish molecule. First, the chlorine departs, leaving a positive charge on the carbon. Second, hydride shifts begin to take place as rearrangement occurs. This is the basis of carbocation rearrangement, ignoring some of the details. Finally, a weak base pulls an H plus away during its shift, and its bond folds in to form a new double bond. In reality, the bond doesn't simply rotate in, as this cartoon suggests. Once the H plus leaves, the bond transition is essentially instantaneous. In either case, this simplistic cartoon gives us a starting point, or ballpark approximation of the process. Okay, so by now we know that E1 starts with the detachment of a leaving group. But can any carbon chain leaving group combination begin the process? Well, let's try this chloroethane. It certainly looks like the chlorine could break free, in theory. Its bond is stretching after all, but we would spend all day watching it fail to detach. As it turns out, chloroethane is a lousy candidate for the E1 mechanism. To understand why, let's review the stability of carbocations. Carbocations are most stable in tertiary form, and least stable in methyl form, as this scene originally from my carbocation video shows. If we apply this understanding to our chloroethane molecule, we can see that if a chlorine breaks free, it will leave behind an unstable primary carbocation. That's not very good, so in theory, it should be highly unlikely for the chlorine to leave, even with heating. Perhaps we'll have better luck if we try a secondary or tertiary chlorine. Let's do a simulation to see for sure. Here we see four molecules, from chloromethane to t-butyl chloride. This simulation measures the number of times the chlorine detaches from each kind of molecule, and resets each molecule after each detachment. Watch as time goes by. The t-butyl chloride tends to detach much more often than the others, or, putting it another way, we see that spontaneous detachment of a leaving group increases in probability when it is attached to a tertiary carbon, then secondary, and so forth. Primary leaving groups and those attached to methyl carbons have an extremely low rate of detachment. So, instead of trying out the E1 mechanism on the slow chloroethane, let's try this molecule. It has a secondary chlorine. With heat, we can get this to detach. To minimize confusion, I'll keep the molecule still and only show the relevant changes. Okay, we know a double bond will ultimately form, but where? We also know that carbocation rearrangement can occur, so in theory the double bond could form on any of the carbon-carbon bonds. Here are some of the possibilities. If a double bond forms on the carbon-carbon bond on the far right, we get the first possible product. If the double bond forms in the center, we get the second product. Finally, if double bonds form on either of the leftmost carbon-carbon bonds, the result is the same molecule as shown here. I'll rotate one molecule around and merge it to prove that they are identical. So, where will the double bond occur? Let's try out a simulation to see. Here are 100 of those molecules. Watch as they gradually start the E1 process by jettisoning a chloride. Shortly thereafter, individual H plus ions break free. It may seem like these fly off spontaneously, but in reality a weak base is typically required. For simplicity, I've left the base out of it. Otherwise, the screen would be impossibly cluttered, causing confusion and frying my computer. At any rate, notice before long how the middle bond pulls out ahead, denoted by the green molecule at the very bottom. Let's fast forward. As you see, the middle bond wins as the most probable. The outcome may seem strange, but it is actually part of a larger pattern. Double bonds become more and more stable as you increase the number of carbon substituents surrounding the double bond, as shown in this scene. The reason for this is essentially the same as why carbocations are more stable with greater carbon substituents, hyperconjugation, as covered in my carbocation rearrangement video. 
Okay, so the double bond will tend to form between carbons that have the most substituents, but we still have one last subtlety to cover for the E1 mechanism. Here we'll use 2-bromobutane to illustrate what that subtlety is. If heated, the bromine will detach, as anticipated, leading to several possible places for the double bond to form. Double bonds forming in either of the end positions form the same product, as you can see when I merge them. Let's ignore this outcome and focus instead on what happens when the inner bond forms a double bond. We get two possible outcomes, a cis isomer and a trans isomer. Which one will be most likely to form, cis or trans? Once again, I have a simulation to show us. Here are 100 of the bromine compounds, and I've set this up so that the double bond can only form across the inner bond. As you can see early on, the trans version seems to be forming much more readily. So let's fast forward to see if the trend holds. Apparently it does, but why? The reason is because of steric hindrance. When in the cis conformation, the two nearby carbon groups tend to butt heads, so to speak. Let's twist the double bond over to make it trans. Not easily done, by the way. Once in the trans configuration, the two carbon groups no longer bump into each other, resulting in a more stable double bond. The E1 mechanism starts with a leaving group detaching, usually from a tertiary or secondary carbon. The loss of the leaving group leaves a positive charge on the carbon chain, followed by variable amounts of carbocation rearrangement. Finally, a weak base pulls an H plus from the carbocation, leaving a double bond behind. The loss of the H plus using a weak base proceeds because the positively charged carbon chain is inherently unstable. Although rearrangement helps to alleviate the instability, sort of like juggling around a hot potato, the carbocation ultimately needs to get rid of the positive charge somehow. It can't just rearrange forever. As it turns out, deprotonation is only one possible means of solving that problem. A second solution is to neutralize the positive charge by attracting another negative charge, such as a nearby nucleophile. It would look something like this. This second route is the basis for the SN1 mechanism, which we'll study in another video. For now, I'll leave you with a simple pattern that will often help you to distinguish between E1 and the other mechanisms. Generally, I think of the E1 mechanism as the default mechanism when a tertiary or secondary leaving group is heated, with nothing else around except maybe a mild base. In the presence of almost anything else, suspect that a different mechanism will occur. Once again, that's a ballpark kind of approximation, but it can help in a pinch. Well, that about covers the basics of the E1 mechanism. See you up ahead.